Well, it's very heartening for me to have uh, not only many young people uh, visiting each evening, but to see some of the senior members of the family of God coming along. We thank you for your prayers and your encouragement, although you've learned many of these things before I was born, but I, I'm grateful for you coming along and being such an encouragement to us. And uh, as the Apostle Paul said, uh, to stir up our pure minds by way of remembrance. And I trust that this will happen this evening and we'll enjoy together the blessed truths of the Apostles' doctrine and prayer. In uh, lesson two, we thought about the four gatherings or purposes for gathering in the early church, four key reasons to gather. Uh, we saw that they showed the outflow of truth and love and worship and power. The uh, Apostles' Doctrine, Fellowship, Breaking of Bread, and Prayers. These are the first and last, and they show this wonderful link that God has given the church. We have been commissioned with a massive task to reach the world for Christ. The Lord Jesus will not be satisfied with anything less than world dominion. And he has commissioned us to be involved in this great work. And therefore, we need a supply line to headquarters. We need a means of communicating with God and a way that God may flawlessly communicate his will to us. And how God has given this to us is through God speaking with us through his word and we speaking with him through prayer. And I'm just going to read a verse or two with you in Acts, the early chapters. In Acts chapter 1, first of all, and verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. We see it again in Chapter 2, they were all with one accord in one place. When the Spirit of God came down upon them, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, we read in verse 4. And we discover that as we read through the book of Acts, one of the marks of the church was that in moments of crisis, they turned instantly to God in prayer that in times of persecution, rather than withdrawing and retreating, they prayed that God would give them boldness to move on in triumph against the forces of the enemy. They expected God to answer their prayers. They believed that prayer was something that they had not invented, they didn't think of themselves as beggars coming to a reluctant God, but as children coming to a father. The Lord Jesus had said, the father himself loveth you. And fear not, little flock. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And hitherto you've asked nothing in my name. Ask my father and he will do it for you. And so with this encouragement from the Lord Jesus himself, they came into the presence of God and they asked God-sized prayers, didn't they? They asked big things of God. And the apostle felt very well within his right to instruct us to pray for all men everywhere. <laughs> That's a big prayer, isn't it? To pray that we might be filled with all the fullness of God to pray that we might be fruitful in every good work. So as we think of this marvelous link that we have with God and this wonderful way that God communicates flawlessly to us through his word, I trust the Lord will encourage our hearts to realize that we're not on our own here. He has commissioned us, he has called us to a great work, but he has not left us to our own resources. And to lay hold of 
of the riches which God has made available to his people. Now we want to think first of all about the apostles' doctrine. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Sometimes we separate in our thinking practical Christian living and Bible doctrine, as if somehow doctrine was impractical. But the word doctrine is simply the word for teaching, and it embraces all of the revelation of God, what might be called the faith or the truth once delivered to the saints. The full expression of the heart of God revealed to us in the word of God. This is obviously a remarkable book. When you open this book, you're actually opening heaven. And you're looking right into the mind of God and you're thinking God's thoughts. And you have available to you as your 24 hour a day private tutor, the very one who inspired the book in the first place. The Holy Spirit of God who breathed, who, who bore along those holy men selecting different men with different personalities and different vocabularies and different life experiences. He, he worked through these men in such a way that they communicated, manifesting their personalities on the pages of Holy Scripture, writing as other men didn't write, and yet the finished product was the very Word of God. This comes to us in three stages. There is, first of all, the wonderful work of revelation. To think that the mighty mind of God could somehow be communicated to men. God said, I'll speak to you uh, with stammering lips and another tongue. I'll get down to your level. It will be here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept. I'll communicate it to you in such a way that it will be the very mind of God, but it will be communicated in a way that you'll be able to understand it. And so the truth of God, first of all, came in one glorious stream of truth, the unfolding, the progressive revelation of God from the earliest days when men like Job, Moses, picked up their pens and began to write, and God communicated his truth, first of all, from his heart to holy men by revelation. And then we have the second stage of inspiration, the process by which the truth of God passed through these men's minds and hearts and personalities and life experience onto the pages of Holy Scripture in such a way that it was a flawless transmission of the truth of God. Then, lying latent on the page, the Spirit of God then, by illumination, takes that truth off of the page and brings it into our hearts and minds in such a way that we become living epistles. The very truth that men could read if they dared open the Bible, they can read in your daily life. They can see the truth manifested in 3D, an audio-visual, as you live out the truth that the Spirit of God has worked into your life, working out our own salvation, for it is God who has worked it in. And so we manifest the truth, which was first in the heart of God, communicated to holy men, transferred onto the pages of Scripture, and then by the Spirit of God revealed to our hearts so that we might live out the very heart of God before men, that men may see our good works and glorify our Father, which is in heaven. Absolutely breathtaking, isn't it? I think it's just so wonderful that, that God feels that somehow through the transmission there still can be sufficient truth communicated through our lives 
It's not so badly distorted that God says, I'm sorry, I can't use that. It's not, it's not fair to, to give people the impression that I'm like this. No, God somehow has found a way to use us with all our faults and failings and weaknesses. Somehow God is able to translate through our lives this wonderful truth. Now, John tells us in his first epistle that it's possible for an individual believer, if you were the only Christian in the world, it would be possible for you to understand the truth of God. You have an unction from the Holy One, an anointing from the Holy One, and you don't need anyone to teach you, he says. If you were a Christian in an isolated Muslim village somewhere in North Africa, you would be able to understand sufficient truth to live the Christian life as the Lord meant it to be lived. There are Christians in some parts of the world have only a few pages of scripture, but they have the Holy Spirit of God, and he's able somehow to use the truth that they have to transform their lives to be like the Lord Jesus. We heard of one man who trusted the Lord in Siberia before the wall came down, he had no Bible, but he had a passion to know God. And he said, well, we had dictionaries of atheism. And in order to argue against the Bible, they had to quote the Bible. And so I got scissors and glue and a notebook. And I cut all the Bible verses out of the dictionary of atheism and stuck them in a notebook. And that's what I read. And that's how God saved me. Oh, the mighty power of the word of God, the transforming power of the word of God. On the other hand, there are some people who say, well, I'm just a man of one book, you know, I just read the Bible, I don't read other books. Well, as we noticed the other evening, God has seen fit to enrich the church. When the Lord Jesus rose from the dead, before he went back triumphantly to heaven, he shared the spoils of his victory with the church. And he enriched the church by giving, among other things, teachers to the church. Those who have a special gift, not to understand the Bible, that's given to every one of us. If we have the indwelling spirit of God, we should all be students of the word of God. And the truth of God is within our grasp. But God has given certain individuals a supernatural ability to clearly communicate the truth of God in a cohesive and comprehensive way, in such a way that God's people can receive it and enjoy it and live it out. And we notice from Ephesians 4, the role of the teacher is not simply to teach the word of God, but to equip the saints so that they can study the word of God for themselves and pass on the truth that they know. As Peter said, if someone walks up to you and says, what is it about you? Why are you different? You should be able to clearly explain the reason for the hope within you to clearly explain why you believe what you believe. Now, the Apostles' Doctrine is not simply a, a wedge of truth. The Apostles' Doctrine covers every issue that impinges on the life of the individual believer and on the life of the local church. This scripture, said Paul to Timothy, is able, is sufficient to equip you for four key things. It is, it is sufficient to help you with teaching sound doctrine, for refuting false doctrine, for correcting bad morals, and for instructing you in good morals, both positively and negatively, both theory and practice, if you will. Paul said it is sufficient to cover every aspect of doctrine and practice. Now, there are some Christians who would say the Bible is good as far as it goes. However, there are certain gaps in the revelation in which we're just at sea. We just have to make up our own judgment here. That's a very frightening position to take. Instead, says Paul to Timothy, this scripture is sufficient to equip the person who puts their trust in God to equip them to every good work. And if it's not a good work, you shouldn't be doing it, right? So the word of God is sufficient to equip you to every good work. 
And if there's something you feel is not in the Word of God, you've missed it. The Word of God is revealed to us, of course, in various layers. We have specific commands. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. There may be some things there are, there's wiggle room in, but when it comes to a statement like that, it's a plain fact, and we either obey it or disobey it. There are clear precepts given to us in the Word of God. And then secondly, there are principles given to us in the Word of God. And these principles are laid out in general terms. For example, in the church, let all things be done decently and according to order. Or let all your things be done in love. Or let all things be done unto edifying. And there are many such general principles which are like filters through which I pass a particular action or activity or attitude. And if it passes safely through that filter and it takes, uh, it's, it's approved by God, well, there are a series of these filters. And if I can put them to the test and I find that they, uh, for example, uh, whatever is true and lovely and honest and just and praiseworthy uh, of good report, well, good. There it is. It passed the test and it's something that I can think about. So God has given us these principles, not necessarily always in general specific precept, but general principles. And then thirdly, the Apostle Paul tells us that God has communicated some truth to us by examples. These things were written for our examples, uh, both positively and negatively. They're written to uh, warn us. They're written to teach us positively and negatively. Uh, as they say, some of these stories in the Old Testament, uh, no one's absolutely useless. You can always be a bad example. And so there are some of these bad examples brought before us. Don't be like this. Don't do that. And on the other hand, there are good examples set before us and what we ought to do. So we have another layer of truth of examples that are given to us in Scripture relative to our behavior and our belief. Now, I've, I've made some comments here regarding the teaching of the Apostles' Doctrine. I have quoted 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, which speaks to us of the need not only to embrace the truth, but especially for those who are equipped to teach and to lead in the life of the church, it's our responsibility to pass on the truth to faithful men. Now, there are some who say uh, the sheep and the lamb should always feed together. In other words, everybody should be together for the teaching of the word of God. Well, the Bible tells us that older women are to teach the younger women. Uh, that obviously is not in a general meeting of the church. Likewise, here we discover that the more mature brethren are to take younger men who are serious about the things of God, who are faithful men, who are committed to the truth of God and to living the life of faith, and they are to take substantial time to communicate the truth to them. This is not some sort of general meeting. Uh, this is a sp specific responsibility to pass on in an orderly way, in a systematic way, the truth of God to another generation of faithful men who will not simply live it out, but who will also teach it to others. So this is, this is something that's quite specific, isn't it? The passing on of the truth to others. I mention here that especially those who are responsible in the local church for the teaching of the word of God, they need to be aware. There are a lot of dangers out there. And one of the marks of our present day is what we might call intellectual mobility. There was a day when people lived on the farm, they rode down to the local church, uh, they listened to the teachers within that local church and they went home again and they were largely untouched by the broad sweeping winds of doctrine that may be out there in the wider world. But today through internet, through magazines and audio tapes and all sorts of other means, uh, the believers are confronted with a wide array of ideas regarding the truth of God. I have included a little later in our study a series of tests, simple tests which Christians may use when they hear certain things 
to assess orthodoxy. Is it, is it true? Can I trust it? And in the back of our uh, notebook, there are two charts, one which is a list of the major doctrines of the Bible, and this, I hope, will be especially helpful to elders who, as they listen to the ongoing ministry in the life of the local church, will be able to track it and see if there are gaps in the teaching of the Word of God. Now, some would say, well, we wouldn't want to do that because then that would be overriding the Holy Spirit. Don't you know that the Spirit is the one who um, communicates to the, those who teach the Word of God, and we wouldn't want to interfere with that? Well, the Apostle Paul obviously didn't know about that because he wrote to Timothy, and he specifically told Timothy, for example, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19, and 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 14, he gave him specific instructions on what to teach the saints. He said, now you be sure and tell the people this. So it's, it seems to be quite appropriate that senior men who are listening to the teaching of the Word of God will say, this is an area we haven't been covering. I want to warn you, brethren, if you neglect a particular truth, the devil will teach it. The church suffers for a heresy, with a heresy, for everything they fail to teach. And if you don't teach the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, you can be sure someone else will do it, with a very different twist. If you don't teach the doctrines of salvation, if you don't teach the doctrine of the person of Christ, if you don't teach these things, then that's where error comes in. And when you suddenly stand up on your hind legs and say, wait a minute, what's this? Say, well, that's no way to teach it. And they say, well, we never heard about from you at all. I like how they teach it better than how you don't teach it. And so it's important for us that as we see the ministry in the life of the local church, you know, there are certain passages and certain themes that are much more amenable for teaching. I ran a publishing house for many years, and we would get, for every book on Romans, we'd get half a dozen books on Ruth. Uh, the book of Ruth is a nice little book, you know, <laughs> and it's nice to write about it, nice to talk about it, much easier than plowing your way through the middle chapters of Romans. And the tendency is that in our public ministry sometimes we tend to slide over some things and uh, not deal with other issues. How important it is for us to see not only all the doctrines, all the teachings in the Word of God, but to see the proportion and balance which the Spirit of God gives to those doctrines so that we don't major on minors. You'll see, for example, very often in the life of the local church that we have a great deal of teaching on um, devotional ministry, on... Um, information, you know, the uh, types of the Old Testament, the stories of the patriarchs, all sorts of interesting things that we hear. But how much of our public teaching is on, for example, how to get along with each other? Now, when you read the New Testament, it's just full of instructions on how to get along with each other, isn't it? But somehow, we seem to skip over that, and we get into all sorts of other areas and actually the very practical issue of just getting along with one another seems to be neglected. So as we, as we consistently, carefully work our way through the scripture, it's a big book and there are a lot of issues. But over a period of perhaps five years, hopefully those in that local fellowship will get a comprehensive view of the word of God. The second thing I, I pointed out here is that we not only need to be aware of the winds of doctrine, the issues, I'm not saying that all Christians should, but those who are responsible for the teaching of the Word of God should know the dangers out there and be able to warn the people of God. Paul certainly did. He understood the issues of, of uh, a rising uh, neo-Galatianism, of, of legalism. He knew about uh, the issue of Gnosticism, uh, the, the issue of uh, Greek philosophies, and Colossians chapter 2 is a classic example where he deals with four issues, the devil's trap line, and the answers to each. So 
those who are responsible need to build protective walls for the people of God to protect them against the assault of the enemy against the truth. And then, of, of course, number two, we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared. It's far better to give preventive medicine, to give good, healthful teaching. That's the word that Paul uses to Timothy most often. He says that, that this teaching should be health-producing. It should be uh, appetizing, and it should be um, invigorating to the people of God. As we pass on the truth of God, you know, there are some people who actually make the Bible boring. You have to work at it to do that. The Bible is a thrilling book. And we should not only think about what we're going to say, but how we're going to say it. If your wife simply drags some potatoes out of the garden without washing them, uh, threw them in the pot, threw them whole on the table, uh, there you go, that's supper. Well, thank you very little. It would be nice if you'd use a little garnish and uh, fix things up so that it was a little more appetizing. There are some preachers who spend all their time in the garden and no time in the kitchen. And they haul in all of their, um, uh, shall we say, exegesis. They tell us how many Greek words there are and how many times the word and occurs in the passage. All very interesting things. But um, some of those things, the digging around in the garden, we don't need to know about that. What we do need is teaching that actually comes to life in us. That's what we want, isn't it? We want the teaching to, to be easily absorbed. We want it to invigorate us. We want at the end of a time of teaching to say, ah, so that's what the Lord wants me to do. That's the change he wants in my life. That's the next thing on the list. Good, good. That's what I want to do then. Uh, the Apostle Paul, as he wrote, as I've mentioned here, was always practical in his teaching. He, he always had a therefore. In the light of this truth, how should we live? And as the Lord Jesus said, if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. Not if you know them. The joy in truth is not in knowing it, but in living it, in doing it, in seeing the truth come to life within me, and be practical and useful. I, I suggest that we need to be thorough. The, the danger is that we only have a fragmented view of Scripture. Sometimes Christians who are exposed to a lot of teaching feel like they're trying to put the jigsaw puzzle together and they've never seen the picture on the box. Isn't it helpful to see the picture? So that at least you sort of know where things go? It gives you some anticipation as to how things actually fit together. And thanks be to God for those Christians who spend sufficient time in the Word of God that they can show us how some of the pieces fit together. They can show us how these truths run through the Word of God and how they connect with one another. Because sometimes we feel like our brain's in a blender. We have all these bits and pieces flying around in our heads. And for the life of us, we don't know how they work together. Truth is a body. And, and these truths all fit together somehow. And we are grateful for those who spend the time and who think carefully through it so that we don't just get a little of this and a little of that, but we start to see bone come to bone and we see how it works together. Now, Paul warns about doctrinal error. I mentioned that um, the Bible's friends have caused us some grief, usually by having the truth out of place or out of proportion. There's a danger that sometimes we take a truth, a good truth, but we don't have it in the right place in Scripture. It's misapplied. And we need to rightly divide the word of truth. Very often, we'll see people who misapply teaching regarding Israel to the church or the kingdom to the church. There are some people trying to live in the last dispensation <clears throat> under law, and there are some trying to live in the next dispensation under the kingdom. And we need to rightly divide the word of God. At the same time, we don't want to overly distinguish things so that we separate things that are connected. <clears throat> 
And sometimes when we look at the various periods of time in the Old Testament, we don't see the commonalities, we don't see the flow of history and how God's purposes reach from creation to consummation. So it's important for us to make careful distinctions that the Word of God does, but not to overly subdivide the Word of God and essentially take the butterfly and cut it into pieces to see how it flies and it doesn't fly anymore. So we want to see how all of these pieces not only distinguish from one another, but we want to see how they all work together and form this cohesive whole. I give you some reasons here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them, but I give you some reasons why there is error, why there are so many different views on the Bible. This is a common question, isn't it? If, if the word of God is clear, if the spirit of God has been given to every Christian, why is there so much differing opinion? Why is there so much confusion in Christendom? And I suggest a few reasons, but I would simply point out that for some people, they have a vested interest in some things not being true. Because the truth cuts us, doesn't it? The, the, the word of God is a sword that separates between soul and spirit, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so the word of God will come in and it will touch me. It will convict me. And so there are people who turn aside the sword because they don't want it to get to them. And that's a danger for all of us, isn't it? That as we listen to the word of God, we think to ourselves, what an excellent message. Too bad the people who needed it weren't here tonight. I don't know how many times I've heard that, but I sometimes wonder if, um, if we've somehow tried to turn the sword aside from doing its work in our own hearts. I need the truth. You need the, we all need the truth. And we need to lay hold of that principle that when God speaks, he's speaking to me. Now he may have something to say to other people too, but I want the Lord to speak to me. So the danger of having a, a vested interest in error. And then secondly, an inconsistent life. The Apostle Paul was constantly reminding Timothy of the need that his life and his doctrine match. Because you know what happens if not? A after a little while, you'll start to adjust your doctrine to fit your lifestyle. You know, we read about the deeds of the Nicolaitans becoming the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So that if you are, have an inconsistent practice, the danger is that you begin to see things in the Bible that promote your particular view of things. As someone has written wonderful things in the Bible, I see when they're put there by you and by me. And so people start to look at things and they start to rest the scripture. In other words, they, they take a verse out of its context, they twist it, and they use it to promote a certain way of thinking, which is not what the Lord is saying, but they use it for their own ends. That's a dangerous thing to do, isn't it? Then there are some people who have a careless approach to Bible study. I recommend uh, William MacDonald's Here's the Difference, where he goes through and shows the various tenses to salvation, the various judgments, the distinction between Israel and the church, and the church and the kingdom, and various other doctrinal distinctions that need to be made in very simple terms. He explains these. It's an excellent book. If you have a copy, well, buy one for a young Christian and give it to them. I already have one. You don't have to give it to me. So we want, in, in our own lives, we want every time the word is taught, we want the truth to be bought, and then we want the change to be wrought, right? That's the process. I hear it taught, and then the scripture says, buy the truth. You, you have to pay a price for it. If I come to hear the word of God, I come as a window shopper, and I haven't brought anything with me, I probably will go home empty. When my I have three teenagers in the home right now and they want to go to the shopping mall. I purposefully leave all my money at home and I take them down and I'm just sauntering around and I go into a shop and it seems as if the uh, sales clerks have little antenna and they know who's there just to window shop. 
They, they know that I have no interest in buying, and they just leave me alone. And I wander around, and I pick things up, and look at the price underneath, and put it down again. I'm not going to pay for that. No siree. And sometimes we come into the teaching of the Word of God like this. We listen to the Word of God, and we go home just the way we came, because we're not prepared to pay the price. And so if we want to grow, if we want to develop, I've seen many Christians, new believers, pass many Christians in the first few years of their Christian experience. You know why? Because the rate of growth in a Christian's life has virtually nothing to do with how much they know. It has to do with how quick they are to obey what they know. And if my heart says, that's it, that's what I want, there'll be a price to pay. It may be in time. It may be in humbling myself. It may be in confession and setting something right with another Christian. I don't know what it will be. But there's always a price to pay. The truth is costly. You can't give away the truth. You have to buy the truth and sell it not. And then number four, probably the most solemn of all, the Apostle Paul speaks of a day when people will turn their ears from the truth, like people purposefully turning the windmill away so it doesn't catch the wind. They, they don't have an appetite for spiritual things, and they gather to themselves men who tickle their ears they just want to be entertained. They have no interest in hearing the truth whatsoever. And I have an interesting quotation there from Frank Holmes. He says, experience shows that agnosticism regarding a doctrine is the first step to denying it. The brother who says of a certain truth, well, I used to believe that. I'm not sure now. I don't think anybody can be sure on those points is probably a good halfway to heresy. This type of agnosticism is increasing among believers with the increase of higher education. It's the fashionable cant of the intellectual world, the idea being that truth is unattainable anyway and that orthodoxy is the badge of a low intelligence. But this position cannot be squared with Christianity, for Christian teaching is a dogmatic assertion of truth received by divine revelation. It is the faith once delivered to the saints. To be a straw Christian carried about with every wind of doctrine may be a mark of intellectual sophistication, but it is not a mark of spiritual maturity. Now, having said that, Christians, we have to recognize that we are fellow helpers to the truth and that none of us is right about everything. I hope that's not too much of a shock for your sensibilities. There have been times when I thought I was right and I found out I wasn't right. And maybe you've had an experience like that too. And so while we want to be very definite about what we believe, we want to embrace the truth and stand on it, we need to be gracious with one another too, don't we? With people who are sincere believers, who are honest seekers for truth, we need to be gracious. And the Apostle Paul said, if there are those who oppose themselves, in other words, if you hold false doctrine, it's a self-inflicted wound. And if they oppose themselves, don't you oppose them too? You meekly instruct them. You graciously instruct them in such a way that you're winsome. Don't use the truth as a, as a bludgeon. Feed the people of God. Give them something that's good and tasty, and they'll respond to it. But don't be ungentlemanly in your dealing with the people of God. I mentioned these tests of orthodoxy here, and you might find them helpful. If there's something that I hear that demeans the person of Christ, that undermines his nature, that lowers him in my appreciation, I know it's wrong. Because the Lord Jesus is altogether lovely. God has seen fit to give him preeminence over all things. You can't think highly enough about the Lord Jesus. One of my favorite quotations someone has said, we may speak of him as much as we wish and praise him to the bound of our capacity without ever being reprimanded by heaven for exaggerating his excellencies. <laughs> you can never say too much about the Lord Jesus. That's a good test of orthodoxy. What think ye of Christ is the test to try both your state and your scheme. You cannot think right in the rest unless you think rightly of him. And John points this out, that if you want to test the spirits, 
If you want to test religions or belief systems, find out what they think about Christ. And that's where they'll go wrong, the person and work of the Lord Jesus. And then secondly, does it elevate man apart from the cross work and his standing in the Lord Jesus? The church has been designed to maximize the glory of Christ and to minimize the glory of man. And anything that exalts man is putting man in the wrong direction, isn't it? Humble yourself under the hand of God. He'll exalt you in due time. Anything that exalts man is putting man in opposition to God. The story is told of the young man in the prayer meeting who waxed eloquent one night and said, Oh, Lord, humble me. And an old brother called out and said, Don't do it, Lord. Let him humble himself. <laughs> it's a solemn thing when God has to humble you. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. He'll exalt you in due time. You see, the world's upside down because of sin, isn't it? When the early apostles went out, they accused them of turning the world upside down, but it was upside down already. They were turning it right side up. And anyone who thinks that they're going to the top is actually going to the bottom. The Lord Jesus went to the bottom, and where is he? Well, he's at the top. You have to fight your way to the bottom. There's lots of room down there. That's the battle, isn't it? Not to fight your way to the top, but to the bottom. And so anything that elevates man apart from the cross work is wrong. Does it depend on an obscure verse or a forced interpretation? Now, Christians, it's not just the cults who are guilty of this, is it? I've heard quotations, I've, I've heard verses taken out of Deuteronomy and Leviticus and applied in all sorts of creative ways. We need to be very careful that we're not using verses like this to push our agenda when it's really not what's in the heart of God at all and actually using it to fashion burdens for the people of God, to, to restrict the people of God in their manner of life in a greater way than the Lord himself would do it. We need to be very careful about that. And taking verses about, um, for example, um, uh, a woman in man's clothing and making that out to be a certain kind of clothing and proving the case from that is really a resting of the scriptures, isn't it? Um, if you go over to the Middle East, you'll find out that both the men and women wear skirts, if you'll excuse the phrase. And so it certainly doesn't mean the, what, what it's applied to mean. Uh, if you go to India and it's the men who wear the skirts and the ladies who wear the pants and uh, whatever you call them over here, uh, trousers. And, uh, uh, you know, you, you go to different cultures and uh, different situations and to somehow take that to mean that this is, this is what the Lord had in mind. Well, I mean, a person can say, well, maybe this is a, this is a sort of a, an extreme application and maybe it'll give you a little help here. But to say that that's what the Lord meant when he wrote those words is not fair to the text. And I think there are many such things where we grab a verse here and there trying to prove our case and we're not being fair because we're saying this is what God is saying, right? That's what we're saying. We're saying this is the word of God and this is what God is saying. And God takes offense at that, you know. In fact, the prophets of old, if they spoke words that were not the words of God, they were to be taken out and stoned with stones till they were dead. So it's a solemn thing, isn't it? When we take things and say, this is what God is saying, when in fact God's not saying that at all. So we, we need to be very careful about our applying scripture uh, to prove our case. Taking an obscure verse or an enforced interpretation to prove our case. And then does it contradict the overall tenor of scripture? This is one of the great things about having a sweeping understanding of the word of God. That when somebody turns to a passage in Ezekiel and says, this is what it means, I may never have studied that chapter, but if I have an understanding of the basic themes of the Bible, I can say, well, I don't particularly know what it means, but I know it doesn't mean that. Because I have an understanding of the broad base of scripture. When we open the word of God, we discover there are four major themes in the word of God. There's the revelation of God's person and the revelation of God's plan, and the revelation of God's provision, and the revelation of God's people. That's it. That's the full revelation of the Word of God. The revelation of God's person, the doctrine of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The revelation 
of God's provision. God is a giver in creation, in providence, and in redemption. The revelation of God's plan, God is working out his will in history. And the revelation of God's people, the Jew, the, the nation of Israel, the church, the remnant, God has worked through people. He has chosen vessels to accomplish his purposes. So when we study these things, they'll result in a different response in each case. The revelation of God's person will result in worship. The revelation of God's provision will result in thankfulness, in appropriation and thankfulness. The revelation of God's plan will result in obedience and cooperation with God in his purposes. And the revelation of God's people will result in carefulness and rightly dividing the word of truth and understanding that not, while everything in the Bible is written for me, it wasn't all written to me. So when we look at these themes, when we understand the broad base of the word of God, if something comes up that seems strange to me in the thinking of scripture, I say, well, I don't know specifically what it means, but it doesn't seem to follow the broad sweep of scripture. I leave the rest with you. Our time is running on. But you can look at these and you can use these as a little test uh, for uh, teaching that you hear in other places. I want to get to the subject of prayer a little bit here, and I want to remind you that heaven is open to the child of God. And just as God reveals his truth to us through prayer, he through the word of God, he reveals his truth to us in no uncertain terms, he has invited us into his presence. Now, how does prayer work? Some people say, why do we even pray? After all, God knows everything. He's not waiting in heaven until we pray to him. The scripture says, before they call, I will answer. What, what is the purpose of prayer and how does it work? Well, you know, at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit of God came down upon the church and every believer was filled with the Holy Spirit. And Paul explaining in Romans chapter eight says, that every Christian has an intercessor in the heart. The Holy Spirit has moved in to help us in our prayer life, one of the many ministries he has. He moves us to pray. He helps us when we don't know what to pray. And when we do, he translates our prayer into a God-sized request. In other words, he takes it it gets to heaven in the revised version. He takes our stumbling request and he translates it into something that matches the will of God. Likewise, we have an intercessor in the heavens, says Paul in Romans 8. We have one who sits on the throne, a real man, who ever lives to make intercession for us. And when we don't pray for us, he prays for us. We're on his prayer list and he's praying us home every step of the way. He knows us. He knows our needs. He anticipates problems we don't even know are coming. And he's praying for us. Oh, what a wonderful thing. He ever lives to make intercession for us. Well, now in this grand scheme where we make requests and God provides and people are blessed and the, the glory and the thanksgiving redounds to God, the only bit in the whole process that we can do is the asking. He says, you ask and my father will do it. And when my father does it, the blessing of God comes down and it results in many giving thanks to God. It redounds to the glory of God. So God says, you ask, I'll move your heart to ask. And when you ask, I'll answer, not according to your asking, but according to my riches and glory by Christ Jesus and many will be blessed, and much glory will rise up to God. So this is our part in the process, the asking part. And I've mentioned various types of prayer here, and uh, little definitions, if you will. And we have some wonderful pattern prayers in the Word of God. We have, in the Old Testament, of course, many wonderful prayers, but specifically for the church, we have prayers in the ministry of Christ, and we have prayers in the writings of the Apostle Paul. I think we only have one recorded prayer of the other apostles, a prayer for boldness in the face of persecution. The Jews understood about prayer. They have many great prayers in their Hebrew scriptures. 
Now, the prayer of Habakkuk, the prayer of Hannah, the prayers of David, the prayers of Moses, many wonderful prayers in the Old Testament. But when we come to the New Testament, it was the apostle to the Gentiles. Why, we were digging around in the entrails of chickens trying to figure out the will of God and worshiping little sticks and stones. We had no idea about prayer to God. And so the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, as he's communicating with the Christians, suddenly he interrupts himself in his writing and he begins to pray for the saints. And he leaves on record these prayers so that we might pray, the, pray these prayers ourselves. Now, Christian, this is an ideal school of prayer, isn't it? Where we already know these prayers have been tested, tested in the first century. We see the results of those prayers in the book of Acts and in the epistles. We see what happened. We see that God answered those prayers and they were fruitful in every good work. And they did increase in the knowledge of God. So we know these are prayers, if you will, that work. Now, we don't mean prayer works. It's God who works. But we know that these prayers exactly match the will of God. They are, they are inspired by the Spirit himself, and they're in the sacred text. Prayers that talk about um, um, the desire that Jews be saved. When was the last time we prayed for the Jews? that they might be saved. And for those who work with the Jews, it was on the heart of Paul, wasn't it? And he calls us to pray the same. He prays in Romans 15 for the like-mindedness of the saints. You know, we, we have these tensions in the life of the local church. When did we pray for that? I mean, corporately, these are for the prayers of the saints. And when we get together and say, Lord, we are at odds in our minds. We don't think the same way about things. We want to. We want to have a lowly mind. We want to have the Lord's mind. We want to be like-minded. It's a good prayer to pray, isn't it? To pray for the powers that be, for kings and all in authority, that they might be saved. Who would you think of praying for uh, Saddam Hussein or Osama bin Laden that he'd get saved? Those are bold prayers, aren't they? But the king, when Paul wrote, was Nero. Can you imagine praying for Nero that he might be saved? Paul said, take this seriously. Pray for him. We need to pray for those in authority. Is that a prayer that we pray in our local churches? Uh, Paul asked for prayer for boldness in witness. Imagine Paul asking for that. We think, well, come on, Paul. You're, you're a natural at that. But Paul asked the saints to pray for this. Do we pray for one another that we will be bold in our witness? When was the last time you heard that prayed in your local fellowship? That we'll be bold in our witness as we move through the day. Uh, in, in Ephesians chapter 1, he prayed for the saints that they might see what they already have, to see how rich they are, how, how much God has generously poured down upon his people. He prays in Ephesians chapter 3 that they might be rooted and grounded in love. In other words, that love might flow through their lives and that the love of Christ might, might fill them in its fullness that they might be filled with all the fullness of God. He prayed that they might abound in love, that they might be filled with fruit. On and on he goes. These are for your own study, but Christian, don't just read them and study them. Pray them. They're real prayers. And God will give real answers to the prayers of his people. So we have this wonderful access by prayer. I was just noticing before the meeting some of the uh, little sentence statements regarding prayer, some little staccato statements. Pray for all men everywhere. I think of some little old ladies sitting in an old folks home somewhere. They look like they're nodding off to sleep. If you could see them as they really are, they'd look like superheroes. They're actually flying across the world to places like Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. They don't even know where they are on the map, half of them. But they've heard about it, and they're praying for them. And they're praying that God will do a work there. You know, we sometimes say, relative to the attributes of God, that 
We can have a part in the moral attributes of God, his love, grace, mercy, and so on, but the absolute attributes of God, they're his alone. But you see, through prayer, we take, we participate in the absolute attributes of God. When I pray, I say, Lord, I don't know what those people need, but you do. And so I'm taking advantage of the omniscience of God. And I say, Lord, I'm not there to help them, but you are. And I take advantage of the omnipresence of God. And I say, Lord, I can't provide for their needs, but you can. And I take advantage of the omnipotence of God. This is what prayer is. It's partnering with God. You know, every time you pray, you're asking God to be your servant. Ask my Father, and he will do it for you. Oh, the humbleness of God, that he would reach down to us and say, you ask me, and I'll do it. And we take advantage of this wonderful relationship with God. Christian, don't ask for little prayers. It's like asking God for change for a penny. He says, I don't think I can break it down that far. Ask me something that's worthy of me. And we need to, we need to say, Lord, enlarge my faith. Enlarge my, my prayers. Help me to pray prayers that are worthy of God. Prayers that take advantage of his generosity. And then he says, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Now, that doesn't mean you're always going around mumbling. <laughs> that somehow, you know, your children come to talk to you and say, Honey, sorry, I, I'd, I'd love to give you some attention right now, but I, I have to keep praying. As if it's some sort of marathon. I think it was uh, Robert Cleaver Chapman who translated this verse, or at least gave his little interpretation this way. Turn everything in life into something to talk to God about. Isn't that beautiful? It may be thanksgiving, it may be interesting, it may be intercession, or supplication, or praise, or worship. But everything in life is something I can take to him. He wants to be included in this. He's my father, and I go to him by the Spirit in the name of the Lord Jesus. I'm welcome 24 hours a day. He loves to hear my voice. I don't know why he wants me around. I'm not his type, you know. But he's embraced me and he's brought me into his family. And he says, keep on the line. Isn't it beautiful when, when God gives his servant Ananias a responsibility to take the gospel to Saul there in Damascus? And he's, he's heard about Saul and he's quite nervous. And the Lord says, oh, it's all right. I have him on the line. He prayeth. <laughs> we're, we're talking right now. You, you can go safely to see him. It's a wonderful thing to meet Christians who are, in the words of Romans 12, 12, continuing instant in prayer. You know, sometimes we use prayer, I don't mean to be offensive to anyone, but kind of like holy water, you see? Somebody tells us a problem and we sprinkle it. We say, we'll have to pray about that. And as if somehow that's done something. <laughs> or we say, praise the Lord. So, well, go ahead, brother. I'll, I'll, I'll join you. To say praise the Lord doesn't mean you're praising the Lord. It just, it's a command, is it? Praise the Lord. Well, well go ahead. Feel free. <laughs> but we sometimes use this little phrase as if that does the job. Well, if we need to pray about it, when would be a good time to do that? Right now, wouldn't it? Please pray for, well, okay, let's do it. When you're listening to prayer requests, pray them up as they go. You'll never remember them all. Just pray them up as you hear them. Instant in prayer. Just take it to the Lord. He's open all the time to hear our cry. And then a very solemn verse in James 5.16. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. I mentioned the other evening, sometimes, you know, local churches become showcases for perfect people. They're not that, because we sure aren't perfect. And to be able to say to, uh, it's not that you get up and you know, tell everybody all of your failures, it's not that. It's that we ought to care about one another, and we ought to be able to say to another Christian, I need prayer, I, I'm struggling in this area right now. 
We all have cracks in our foundation, you know, and we all have them, thankfully, at different places so that I can maybe support you a bit in this and you can support me over here in this. We need to be honest with one another and say, I, I'm really struggling with this. Pray, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Pray for one another. Pray without ceasing. Pray for all everywhere. Continuing instant in prayer. And may the Lord encourage our hearts. This is only a very cursory study of these subjects. There are huge, massive books on prayer and on the study of the Word of God. But just to remind ourselves of the vital necessity of an unbroken link between our hearts and God, between our local churches and God, that we would speak as the oracles of God, that we would communicate what is on the heart of God for his people, and that we would be instant in prayer, opening our hearts to him, not in necessarily long, dry, convoluted, old-fashioned statements, but just to speak to God as to our Father. I mean, what does our Father think when we come into his presence and we feel obligated to make these long, swelling statements that seem to be crafted only for those who are in the room with us and not for God himself. I think if we had longer prayers at home, we could afford shorter prayers when we get together. Brother, you can pray as long as you want in your closet. But when we get together, it's not your responsibility to somehow pray everybody's prayer all tacked on one after the other. We're all praying together. And what a wonderful thing it is to have that sense Brother, I know where you're going, and I'm going with you. To have that sense that he knows the way into the sanctuary. He's been there earlier in the day. He, he knows his way. He's, he's frequently in the presence of the Lord. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? To have that sense of unity in prayer. With one accord, they prayed together. With one heart beating, longing for the will of God, longing for the work of God to pro progress, longing for change in the life so that we could, could become more like the Lord Jesus. May the Lord encourage us as we think of these things to, to remind our hearts again that God loves to hear our voice and he loves us to hear his voice. And there's no reason for a breakdown in communication. He's made everything possible that we might be familiar friends with the God of heaven. Shall we pray? Our Father, we are the first to confess how often in our prayer life we become distracted. Sometimes we allow unconfessed sin to get in the way. We become diverted from the purpose of prayer Sometimes we forget what a great God it is we're coming to and, and how he loves to bless his people. Oh, Father, help us to take advantage of thy generosity. And as we open thy word, and especially those who have the greater judgment, who take the word in hand to teach it to the people of God, oh, keep us from our own private theories, our own private agendas, Help us just to teach what the Spirit of God shows to us in his word. And we pray that as we hear the word of God, our heart will leap within us and we'll see the truth as a beautiful thing, a thrilling thing, and we'll say, I want to be like that. I want to live that truth out. We ask this, Father, as little children who very much need thy help and are very grateful for this two-way avenue which has been provided for us at such cost. We thank thee for thy word and for prayer and for the privilege of hearing thy voice and for the wonder that thou shouldst wish to hear ours. And we thank thee in the Savior's name. Amen. <laughs>